and welcome to From the Rookery, a podcast about a life following Watford Football Club. And we've been following it for, well, our 14th season now. My name's John. Uh, with me, as we look back on the 2-3 home defeat uh, for Watford at home to Middlesbrough on the weekend, uh, I've got Jason with me. Hello there. And Michael. Watcher. <laughs> oh, I, that pause. I was wondering what would be filling that pause, and it's it, it's hopefully still to come. You know, we we we've been doing this for for a while, as we sort of say. And and I, I saw a tweet. Uh, I saw a tweet from our friend Hanson Ho. I think he might actually be one of the first people to listen to this podcast now, because it comes out. Yeah, I put it out like ten o'clock, I suppose, over here on Monday night. He probably gets it at like lunchtime or just l- uh, late afternoon in Canada, so he gets to listen to it at a, a nice hour. Um, and he sort of said, "I'm so tired of every performance, every poor performance, or result becoming a referendum on the squad, head coach, tactics, ownership, etc." Can't a naff game just be a naff game without us coming to all sorts of conclusions? And and I want to start by saying, Hanson. Sorry, we are part of that problem. I know what you're saying, <laughs> and we're going to do it on this podcast. But I don't think I think where we're here, he's going, Michael, is 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 the reactions, I suppose, to to such a thing, to such a result, to frustrations and and all these things and this built up pent up energy that football fans can have. And he's worried. He's, he's I suppose he's, he's fed up of the the people being fed up, isn't he? Yeah, and and it kind of articulates in a much better way what I was trying to to get to at the, the on the podcast with with Charlie and Dave post Leeds last week that I'm kind of all right with just going to watch the football. I'm I'm just kind of okay with that and I know that's not everyone's cup of tea. So I do I get exactly where Hansen's coming from. You, you should be able to just go and watch the game, come home, um stick the telly on, order your Chinese and, and get on with it without thinking oh we're going to sack the manager, what what what's the next ownership going to look like? Uh, why is the recruitment so bad? What's going on with the finances? You should just be able to watch the game, go, that was good, that was bad, or move on to the rest. But of course, we know that, that football isn't like that. And the reason that football is good is because you invest a lot in it emotionally, you invest a lot of time in it, you left a lot of money in it, of course. And I think I've been thinking about it since I saw Hanson's tweet and, and since I saw, since I sort of listened back to my absolute nonsensical ramblings last week on the, on the sort of same subject. And I think what it is, is ultimately, as, as Watford supporters, we are so desperate for something to get behind. We're just looking for something to, to support. We're looking for something to be meaningful and sort of effortlessly enjoyable. And of, of course, sport is never effortlessly enjoyable. It's, you know, football teams lose. You look at Chelsea, for example, um, one goal in September. That's what 900 million quid gets you these days, uh, apparently. But it's it feels like hard work, I think, for Watford supporters at the moment. And I, I totally recognise that. I think a lot of us are just scratching our heads a bit as to as to what the situation is. And, and, and like I said last week, how are we supposed to feel about this, this Watford side? And my personal take on it is that this is actually a likeable head coach with a relatively likeable, if not limited in terms of talent team. The problem is we're now in a situation where we're definitely, well, we're, well, we're one point out of the out of the bottom three with two d- difficult away games to come. Having a likeable head coach and, 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 a, and a more likeable team is, is one thing, but worrying about relegation sort of outweighs that, doesn't it? And it feels like some of the baby steps that we've taken so far this season, and the season is still relatively young, just sort of seem to be... The tide seems to have come in and washed their, their imprints off the sand a little bit. I know what you mean, right? And I think the problem is we all started getting ourselves happy because there was there seemed to be something that we could get behind. And it was going better, a lot better than, than we've been going through for the last few seasons. But but it was it's, it's how we're reacting to it. And I suppose if we look back at the game, the Middlesbrough home game, Jason, it started with... Well, a, a reaction that I wasn't expecting to see with the lineup that we saw. Um, it was three at the back, um, and it was a lot different from, well, from what I've seen before. I think it, it, it was a, a formation that we saw three at the back: Portia, Siralta, and Hood. Of course, Backman in goal, uh, and Gakia, loser, Deli Bashiru, and and Lewis as a four in midfield, or was a spree a bit more central than that? Do you think? So maybe it was a five midfield, and then Ryovic and and Bayo up front. That was a, a, a was that? Would you feel that was a reaction, or he's he's, he's still working through things, Jason? Uh, potentially a reaction, and I must admit, and and hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But mm. 
I wasn't sure about it at the start. I, we talked about the team is more likeable, the manager's likeable. And I think part of that is because in those early games, we could see what they were trying to achieve, even if they weren't exactly achieving it as they would want it to, to happen. Um, and we were we were performing reasonably well in games and it was individual mistakes, be that missed chances or things going wrong at the back that seemed to cost us. Uh, and you think, OK, if we keep working at it, we'll get there at one point. We said, OK, we need a we need a number nine. We've got a number nine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, which doesn't seem to have uh, <laughs> improved things really on that front. But we are scoring goals now, just letting too many in. And you, you sort of think, OK, so why not stick with the formation? As the game went on, you watch it and you think, OK, if we are meant to be playing three four one two as someone told the team because they yeah. to me did not understand what they were meant to be doing if you've got a back three then that back three should be communicating with each other should generally be playing in line you probably have one step out maybe one drop back in when you've got the ball maybe you know different players moving forward our back three on Saturday, seemed to be caught when we were out of possession. Sierra seemed to be playing a more sort of sweeper role. He seemed to be deeper than everyone else. Portius, whilst as the right sided, tighter to Sierra in terms of width, was doing the hokey cokey, which he has been prone to, and seemed to be playing more of a defensive midfield position at every opportunity. And who. If he'd been playing any more left back, I think it'd have been in Watford General Car Park. It'd just be so far out wide behind Lewis, obviously stuck to the to the wing on the left, um, and Gakia stuck out wide on the right. The midfield were offering no defensive protection whatsoever. They were pushed forward, so you had massive gap in midfield, and perhaps that's why Porteous was, was looking to push out all the time. Massive gaps in midfield that, that Middlesbrough were exploiting. And then they had gaps to the left and right of Sierra Alta, again, that they could easily exploit. It, it's a wonder they didn't score more, really. They probably yeah. got themselves to blame. They didn't get three or four in that first half because a, a better team technically would have destroyed us. Backman's had to make early saves for the last month or so. Mm. And finally, we were undone. You know, behind after, what was it, 2 nil down after 12 minutes. Mm. And yeah, Middlesbrough won the week before, but that was, I think, their first win of the season. And as the game wore on, it became apparent that Middlesbrough aren't any better than us, really, in terms of a, 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 a footballing threat, were they? they Finishing goals, they said there's one thing they're better than us. Yeah, yeah, agreed. But it, it was really... But that was, was easy of, for them. It was, we, yeah, yeah we, I think we made it easy for them. The, 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 the space that the guy had for the, the space first one. The space was the thing. Created, created by that that gap where Porteous probably should have been and Sierra Alta sort of left a bit stranded on his own, sort of two men there, maybe more. And yeah, easy finish. And, and again, the second one with the ball just coming through midfield, they were able to pass it at ease because everyone was finding space in a red shirt. Um, and as we then all sort of try and get back and trying to find where we should be, we're all sort of standing around trying to get our positions. We then almost created a shield that Backman can't see the ball, that the guy's able to put it in the bottom corner with ease. Weren't reacting to it at all well, weren't we, Mike? I mean, it, it felt like... Well, I don't know, really. Was he trying to get another one up front? Was he what? trying to compensate for, you know, for Ryovic, who's still, let's not say struggling. rubbish, struggling, raw, all those things, certainly not as quick as you'd hope a striker like him to be, certainly not as imposing himself, certainly not imposing himself as good as the, the two up front uh, that uh, Middlesbrough had. You know, is, is he trying to compensate for that? Well, I think the two, in fairness, the thing that caught my eye initially, and, and as Jason said, with hindsight, the changes didn't work. That was that was apparent within, well, if it wasn't apparent after 12 minutes, it was, it was, it, it was clear very, very quickly. But what caught the eye for me was that he'd got a spear into the starting lineup, which hasn't happened very often. And also, like you mentioned, John, those two, those two strikers and that, I don't know, that, that at the time feels like a bit of a positive change from Valerian Ishmael. And I think you're right. I think Vakum Bayer is very much more dynamic than, um, than Rajevic, who is what he is. He is a classic old school number nine who is 
a tall. He's, he's relatively mobile, but he just can't hold the ball up. He, you know, if the ball goes into him, it's not sticking. He is a sort of number nine that you've got to stick the ball on his head or at his feet on the penalty spot. Um, and that's where he's going to do do his work. And I think that much is is clear already. He, like the rest of the team, is limited in his scope and his ability. That's absolutely fine. He's done what he's been brought in to do already. He has scored a couple of goals, including one very, very good one. That that header was absolutely, absolutely superb. But we've seen his limitations. And I suspect so has Valeri Nishmael. And not only his limitations, but our lim- our limitations in playing to his strengths. All too often, we haven't got balls into the box that he's been able to, to attack or to, to cause a nuisance of himself with. So we've potentially let him down a little bit. So I think, yeah, bringing in um, Vacuum Bayou alongside him, who is a lot more able to come, get the ball, um, lay it off and then move again um, and try and see how they work as a as a pairing, I think perhaps was was sensible and was was potentially a question that had been asked sort of in the pubs of of Hertfordshire over the last couple of weeks. Would would a, a Bayou and Narayevic um, uh, pairing up top be, be worth considering? So, it, you know, it's all, it's all... You can see why he did it to a degree, um, but I think just it's just the, the depth of change, the amount of change throughout the team. I mean, it was, it was an entire switch in terms of how we were, how we were looking to play. And, and as Jason said, none of them looked like they had a clue... Um, as to how it was going to going to pan out, uh, it certainly didn't execute, um, and it it looked like a mess from early on. And qu- quite frankly, it just got worse and worse from there. It was oh, just, it think, was just I, a muddle. I, I think it got it, it did get worse and worse, or well, a little bit better towards the end of the uh, second half, or as the, the first half went on. But <clears throat> there was a point there, Jason. Uh, it took you twenty six minutes. I clocked it. It took you twenty six mm. minutes until you said the phrase. Let's just put it back to what it was before. Mm-hmm. And, and Val didn't change that until half time. And we all had, and everybody around us in, in the rookery end, what would you do? What the changes? And everybody said, we've got to take off Ravic and we've got to put on Martins. And I actually said to you, it didn't feel in that first half what Bio was doing. It didn't feel like we were massively missing Martins until we saw him. Until we actually saw him uh, do what he did at the beginning of the second half. In fact, all the way up until they scored their goal, their third goal. It did feel like Watford were, were, were pushing and we definitely deserved the two goals that we got. Going back to the first half here, what do we need to, to do to, to change it? The, bringing Martins on, I think I, I made that comment, didn't I, about bringing Martins on instead of Ryovic. That was almost, a, rather than it being a get Martins on because we know what he can do and he can bring more to the game. For me, it was more of a, to get it to the shape that we'd been playing before and unfortunately to get Ryovic off the pitch because as Mike has already said he was he was struggling and there was a point in that half where you sort of I guess I was thinking right uh, we need to change it we need to get it back to what it was how do we do we do that with the same players on the pitch or do we do we make a change to get the right players on the pitch for that system and there was a point where Ryovic has come deep to get the ball. He's done a little run and you're thinking, OK, now what are you going to do? Who, who, who have you got around you to pass it to? Do you need to hold it up and wait for someone? And you can you can kind of see he's sort of slowing down and making that thought process himself. Hackney, is it Hackney, the number seven for, for Borough? Mm. Midfielder, not particularly well built, I don't think. Not... Not like one of the big centre backs to knock our number nine, our old school number nine off the ball. This little midfielder's come in and just sort of eased him to one side and said, I'll have that, thank you very much, and turned and run away with the ball. At that point, <laughs> I was like, right, yeah, it definitely needs to be Ravich coming off because yeah. if he's not if he's not able to do something with that, if he's gonna get knocked off the ball that easily as a number nine not today, mate. You're, you, you've got to come off. And it was almost that. It was almost a, right, let's take Ryovic off. We can put Bio in the middle, sort of the, the focal point of the uh, the, the centre of the attack, who, to be fair, I thought had a, a decent enough game. The, 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 him sort of coming in off the left of that partnership, working on his own and sort of picking the balls up and making those runs, they were good runs that he was making. And it worked for the first goal, which was probably a mistake from the the borough defender as much as anything else but it was bio making that run 
that, that make that happen. It just said to me, yeah, look, <clears throat> we've got more of a chance with keeping Bio on the pitch and we have a, 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 with Ryovic on the pitch. If you'd said that to us a year ago, <laughs> you'd have, yeah, you'd have probably said I'm mad. Mike would have lost his head. He would have exploded. We, and we still did see Bio's limitations as well. I mean, you could, hmm. it, was a, it was a difficult chance, but he was through again. Um, his, his first touch was poor, which meant it actually might have helped him take it round the keeper, but his first touch was poor and he ended up, he ended up did going round the, he ended up did going round the key. I get less and less <laughs> able to speak with each passing, passing week. I do not know what's happening to me. He ended up taking it round the keeper, but taking it a little bit wide and had to take his shot a little bit off, off balance. And it looked like a bad miss. And I think that I haven't actually seen the replay, but it was probably harder than it looked, but a better striker and it's two all there isn't it mm, yeah. and and it and it's potentially it's potentially a different game because Watford I think they they are if they get a bit of confidence they can start moving the ball around nicely and it's not beyond the realms of uh, an imagination it would have clicked with some of those 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 players out there um you know you, you wipe the slate clean you get to 2-2 two, two and you and you build again but yeah we saw the limitations of of bio again which in itself is a is a bigger problem because ultimately we're looking at those two as being our strikers you, you wouldn't really want either of them as your first choice really would you to to be honest if we're being perfectly frank so that in itself is a is a bit of a shame and perhaps john feeds into what i was saying at the start in terms of it's all it just feels a bit difficult because you know we're watching players who are potentially wholehearted and full-blooded but ultimately ultimately just um just just not up to it but yeah i agree with jace bio caught the eye a lot more than his than his strike striking counterpart and at least he sort of gives the opposition defenders something to think about but one of the one of the sort of litmus tests that i always apply to the the games a very basic one is is how many how many saves did the opposition keeper have to make sunny dieng did have to make a couple certainly in the in the second half low down to his his left uh, Martin's hit the bar when he was probably beaten, but really, we had what did we have? Nine, nine corners. He he wasn't really called into action that much, and that, and that is a that's a recurring theme I think in in Watford fixtures. I think they are entertainment, uh, they are entertaining, they're they're decent for what they are in terms of Championship football, bit of rough and tumble, um, wholehearted, but but probably lacking in a bit of quality. But we're just really not not creating enough chances, and I think that's. Probably the most disappointing thing for me at the moment. Yeah, you can probably back that up with the numbers. Um, 17 shots we had, four on mm. target. Yeah. 11 yeah. off, I'm assuming the rest were blocked. Uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah, that that tells you lack of quality up front. Espria, I think Dave said it, we, we, we're still trying to find a way for him to contribute a lot more. I'm not convinced, to be honest. I And it may not be down to him, I'm not sure how easy we made it for him to be in the game. And again, sort of coming back to to Ryovic not being a a presence, not being a nuisance to the to the defenders. And you, and you sort of compare, I, I don't want to go back onto Ryovic too much, but you compare to Coburn up front for Middlesbrough, who was causing our defenders, causing Sierra out of a lot of trouble. He was making sure that our defenders knew he was about. Perhaps if Ryovic had done the same, <clears throat> that would have focus some of their defensive actions onto him a lot more and, and maybe freed up the spear a bit more. Um, but a lot of our attempts at attacking football and, and the goal, the first goal certainly came from it, were diagonals from the outside centre-backs, from Porteous, that, that got us the goal. Hoot, we know he can do it with his left foot. He was trying that quite a lot. Trying to get Lewis and Ngakia into the game and wide and causing wide threats. But ultimately, what... For me, the attacking threat seemed to be us trying to put either those diagonals or crosses into the box that were being dealt with reasonably comfortably by the Middlesbrough defenders. They seemed to be on the end of yeah. the majority of our crosses and, and diagonals. And it almost meant that Spreer was being passed by and not in the yeah. game as much as he should have been as a number 10. I totally agree, Jace. I thought the game passed him by entirely and I think you've summed up our game plan. Wesley Hurt trying to sort of hit increasingly hopeful, arcing diagonal balls 
Um, you know, perhaps he'd watched a bit of Etienne Capoue's greatest bits on uh, on YouTube, <laughs> but pretty easy to defend against, weren't they? They've got to be. Mm. Uh, John and I, we were at the NFL yesterday. Know how hard it is to drop a um, a quarterback pass over the defender's head into the into the numbers and where it needs to be. And Wesley Hurt just wasn't able to do that. And t- to answer your original point, John, I think we. I was excited to see a Spreer in the lineup. I think he's a he's an incredibly talented footballer, and I I really like him. I love his um, he's just electric. He, I like his attitude. I like I just like everything about him. But for me, I don't think he featured at all. Really, certainly not to the extent that he'd want as a as an attacking starter or as your flair um, starting player. Because if you look at that initial lineup, he was basically there instead of having. Um, Matthias Martins who I think a lot of people think is Watford's best player certainly on form at the moment or certainly the most in, impactful so that's the sort of standard that you, you hold him against what impact did he have and yeah okay Matthias Martins struggled at, at Leeds so they, they all did I thought the game passed Espria by and I think that's less down to him and more down to the general theme of what we've been talking about this week in, in as much as the setup was was all wrong, it didn't get the best out of out of any of them. The def, the, the defence was laughable. It was it was it was laughable. The, the space, as Jace has alluded to, and I know this is the second or third time we've mentioned it, but I think it bears highlighting. It was extraordinary against the team that that had had been struggling. Um, I dread to think what would happen if we'd been playing Leicester or someone like that with, with you know a real decent team with a real it was just it was just astonishing the midfield was was bent all out of shape as, well, as that, they said it, 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 there's a qu- one person I want to bring up Mike and I don't know if I want to because this is going to be even worse I think maybe in terms of the bad performances in Man Loser hmm. Hmm. you say if Spreer wasn't really around I where is in Man Loser the one I know the one I thought I was falling in love with where is he you, you know that meme of Homer Simpson sort of going back into the bushes <laughs> yes that's kind of what what's happening with him and loser. I think he's he has cut a frustrated figure throughout. I've seen him having a go at um, fellow players. He's looked more and more disinterested as the as the season has progressed, and I think his impact on the pitch has uh, has gone down at, 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 in line with that as well. I think because I know he, he definitely had his. We know there was an incident where he got put on the naughty step for for the beginning of one game. And a massive tragedy has happened in his home country. So I don't know if that is affecting him in any way or it's playing on his mind or anything like that. But like you say, he, he isn't what, what we, we want him to be. But right. then you could say that, that's pretty much all of them, really, isn't it? Not just him. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's someone that we, ex- we have high expectations of. You know, he's, he's one of the few, uh, the tiny clutch of players who you'd, who you'd look at and think, well, they, they could probably play at a higher level or certainly at a, um, at a, at a better club in the, in the championship. And to give Imran Loser some credit, I, I don't think, again, I think the setup was all wrong for him uh, as, as it was for everyone else on, on Saturday. So what, he wasn't able to make the impact that he was, he was signed to do all those, all those years ago. Um, and yeah, okay, he had an injury last year. He, was, he struggled with that, didn't he? He had a couple of injuries. But so I don't think he's being deployed correctly. But I, I just want to see more from him because he, he's a talented player. And we've seen all, very, very often in the Championship that all, all too often it's a bit of quality from an individual that can be the difference in a match. But you've got to be prepared to roll your sleeves up to earn the right to deliver that bit of quality. And for me, he's looking less and less likely to do it. He's, he's looking to the sideline. You know when Jovac Nok- uh, Jovac, uh, Novak Djokovic, um, things aren't going well, he's all of a sudden he's got an injury or he's looking up to his coaches and, and complaining there or the balls aren't right or something. There's always someone else's fault when, um, when Djokovic isn't winning. It feels like it's the same for him. He's moaning, he's looking around, he's, his hands are up in the air, he's sulking. And we haven't got time to do that. We need our better players to be to be performing to the best of their ability, and that means mentally as well. And we know that he was he was dropped against Blackburn, wasn't it, for a disciplinary uh, issue, which I think was uh, missing a, a team meeting. So there's a little black dot against him there, and then you're seeing it on the pitch, and it's we don't. Re- and again, John, it feeds back into that sort of what we were talking about at the start. Um, there's all these little 
all these little reminders of what of what has had made it uh, unenjoyable. And I think, quite frankly, Imran Loser needs to snap out of it, or he needs to stay on the bench. And we'll 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 look at building a sort of more solid midfield without him in it because he's not doing what he's there. He's, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, albeit with the caveat is I'm not, not 100% convinced he's being deployed correctly often enough. No, you, you always want him to be the uh, metronomic type uh, centre midfielder. Um, and also, yeah, that as we go back to the NFL quote, Mark, you know, a quarterback, one there to sort of really dictate the pace and, and everything that is there. And, and that's the role that he isn't, like I say, he isn't playing it. Jace, you know, we, we sort of, you know, critical, I suppose, of, of Val for changing a system that was working. And, and I don't mean tweaking it. He, you know, he, he did change it at the beginning of the game. And, and things got better and we got our, our equaliser uh, fairly early in the, in the second half. Mm. Then they got their third on the 63rd minute, which again just looked like Tom Deli Bashiru and Martins looking at both at each other going, mm. you and me. And then all of a sudden they were off and they were scoring a goal. We'll, we'll pass on that one for now. But the fact that he made, within a minute... He made substitutions for Sierra Alta off and KM Bay on. Luz went off and Chuck Fatazzi came on. And Espria went off and Ince came on. Now, I get the, I get the Espria and the Ince one. Sierra Alta didn't seem injured at all. I don't know what was going on with that. But loser for Chuck Fatazzi, that, that really didn't pay off at all. But I think more than anything, for me, what I was annoyed at, not maybe annoyed at, but, you know, that just... If they had scored that goal... I think if I was Val, I would have turned around and said, lad, sit down, you're one in five. Not you're one in the next minute. The heads had gone from going back behind, mm. and then you're telling them, go and make a bunch of changes, yeah. change positions. Not just one of you, it's three of you are changing, and you know all the players around all the players. You know, it's, it's a big change, changing three players. It needs time to settle. One player can make a big impact. Three, there's some settling time. And doing it at that moment really felt like not a good wise choice to do jace yeah I, you assume because the players were getting ready weren't they that he'd already decided that's what he was going to do yeah but sit down five minutes I, lads i'll get you in a minute that's what he had to do i think yeah i i think a lot of his changes are all around fresh legs aren't they I, I, that's the impression i get yeah. he wants fresh legs on the pitch to 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 try and make something happen we, we know he wants them to work hard because he wants them to to try and press to try and win the ball back early and and that takes stamina and fitness and and hard work to get it right and you, you i just think that's it, it's about fitness and it doesn't matter whether you've conceded a goal or not legs are still going to be tired if they have been working hard which we, <clears throat> whether whether they have or not or whether your opinion is that they, they have or not um it was obviously a lot of chasing going around, chasing shadows, I think, on Saturday. But, uh, yeah, that, that's going to take it out of the legs. So, I think, I'm not saying I, I agree with that, but I think that's that seems to be the mindset that, yeah, I've decided these three players are either looking tired or they've played a lot of minutes in the last few weeks. So, that's they're the players I'm going to take off. I'm going to bring on fresh legs. And you're right, they didn't make too much of a difference. I didn't <clears throat> see anything. Chak Vitadze, I don't think... <sighs> Did we see anything from him? Um, but no. then again, you said he came on for... Obviously, he came on for loser. We didn't get the performance we needed out of loser. Um, Ince probably created our best opportunity, it, it, I guess, other than the Martins one that hit the bar, that the cross he put in, um, that... I can't remember if it's the keeper that got it away or the defendant that got it away across the... Uh, within the six yard box kind of made something happen but at that point with three two down to at home to a team that are probably then just set out to defend they've got the lead they're not going to look to try and, and get any more goals you've shown that you're not very good up front let's see if you can unlock us with what you got and we couldn't i think john i think john's point is with hindsight i think he's absolutely correct because the the proof of the pudding, as we know, is always in the uh, in the. Can eating. I just say uh, we both on on several occasions here we said hindsight. Well, I yeah. thought that at the game. <laughs> just so aware, it's not hindsight. But what I, <laughs> what I mean is, John, is that your point was proven because demonstrably after those substitutions, Watford looked like an absolute mess. I thought 
they looked, it almost looked like there was as too opposed, many players on the pitch. To, as opposed to the mess that we were <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah, the well-oiled off. machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you but did Mark, say, you did quote, Mark, you said on the WhatsApp group, the most disjointed I've seen us all season. Yeah, because, but previously, at least you knew what they were trying to do. And at least the players looked like, looked like they knew what they were trying to do and were trying to execute on a game plan. Um, Jack Vitadze really, really struggled far deeper than it, than he had been um, all season. I think Jace is right to say that, that Tom Ince was a sort of vague bright spark out, out there over on the right and, and Wesley Hurt, the aforementioned Diags, were looking for him, weren't they? Looking to get him him into the game because it felt like he was going to have more of an impact than um, than, a, than a Spreer who was um, out there before that. And and Kembe, I think, actually came on as he did at Leeds and actually looked like a proper midfielder, one that we've been lacking probably all season. I thought Tom Deli Bashir has been very, very up and down this this season. But you, you, sometimes you need a a big water carrying lump in there, don't you? Really, who's gonna who's gonna sort of maraud around and just be that that big sort of central midfielder? And Kembe at least at least does that. I think Chak Fatadze will probably feel the least happy about his individual performance. But as a whole, what those three substitutions, as you say, John, that, had, that happened immediately after the goal, they seem to just add to the sort of sense of discontentment, malaise and, and confusion. And it, it, like I said, it looked like there was too many players on the pitch for <laughs> Watford. They were, they were, all, count? <laughs> they were all sort of bunched up in areas. They were, they couldn't, they couldn't find. And obviously, we like as Jason said, there we're playing against a team who was winning away from home. They got their noses in front for a third time, and they were going to make sure they didn't didn't concede if they could help it. So it, it, they obviously made it as difficult as possible. But Watford looked clueless quite frankly, for that for that last sort of 25 minutes. And I was really, really disappointed with the... Yes, the, the game, the, the tactics weren't on, unlocking Middlesbrough, but their, their intensity seemed to be lacking as well. Yeah. It, would, it just felt so, so flat at a time where we should be kitchen sinking it. I think we got one corner in the last 15 minutes, in the 90th minute. And... That, and I think Dan Batman was going going to go up for that, wasn't he? But um, <laughs> yeah. with with five or six minutes left left to go of injury, yeah. injury time, and I sort of Kiembe was sort of saying, <laughs> um, "Yeah, you, you you pop that back there, Dan. We'll, um, your your life's complicated enough without sort well, of." I, did he, he did get approval from the bench. And then the, the the defenders like no 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 go back go back. It's almost like the players said, "No, we don't need you." We need, slash, we don't want you yeah. uh, around but, here. But that, but that lack of intensity, John. I thought for the last, and and obviously that's a basic sort of thing. It's quite reductive. You want to see it, but there was no, there's no, there's just no speed. There was no sort of intensity or or seeming desire to sort of will their way back into the game. And that's something that I don't think we've actually seen um, too often from this Watford side. At least they've given it a, a a good old go. And I think that Leeds is Leeds is probably the exception to to that rule. I think they. They caved before they'd even got onto the pitch there. But that was, you know, Jamal Lewis ambling around a little bit, taking his time when, to get balls in when he just wanted more from, from the team. And Valerian Ismail came out very quickly and held his hands up and said, I got that one wrong. Uh, effectively, that one's on me. And I, and I think that's right. We, for the way we've discussed it, it was... It was just a mess, wasn't it? I don't think you need to be a tactical genius to see that none of the changes worked, the substitutions didn't really have the desired effect, and the whole thing, and we, well, the whole thing was a mess, and we ended up losing a game that really I felt we should have won. This, I've said I've said that this is a limited side, but this limited side should have been able to beat Middlesbrough's limited side, quite frankly, and 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 they were miles off it. Um, Valerian Ismail's held his hands up, and now he faces. Sunderland away and Cardiff away. Um, and the reality is that we've sort of vague, slept walked really over Leeds away and now where we, where we folded and um, uh, Middlesbrough at home, we've sort of just, we've, we've just collapsed a little bit and now we find ourselves in the situation when we're, if we're re- recording next Monday, we could be talking about a Watford side that's in the bottom three. And, I, and I, that shouldn't really have happened. And I think they've just sort of allowed this malaise to creep in. And 
it's they they need to sort it out um, because I think they're they're good enough and there is enough talent there and we've seen enough from them, albeit we've only seen two wins, but there is enough there for them to play significantly better. Yeah, significantly but, better but, you know, than the, they have. The two things. One, I, I don't think, and I always go back to that promotion during COVID where we know the players stood up with you know, some senior players taking the lead, new manager, but also them you know, fronting up and saying to the team that we need to act in a certain way. There isn't one person, I think, who's going to do that. Well, we shouldn't be at that stage, though. No, 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 no. Apparently, but, but, we've, had but, the, we've had the sort out. We've had the clear out of the, of the dead wood. We shouldn't be having to but it's not talk dead wood. about player it's not, meetings again. No, no, but it's not necessarily dead wood. It's, it's driving force. Mm. Actually, that's, it, yeah, yes, get rid of the dead wood. But actually, I don't see anybody in there to be the driving force. I see senior players, but I don't see anybody who is going to do what was done by Tom Cleverley and uh, Trusty Kong and, and, and you know, play, you know, people we hear about. There's nobody there going to sort out the players. I don't well, see where I don't see where where Valerian do you, is going to have anything to do. No, no leaders. Do you think that's the yeah? When you say driving force, no leaders. We've yeah. Got, yeah, like you say, we've got a captain, we've got a leadership group, haven't we, or some such. Uh, yeah, that, just, that doesn't mean that you've got there, a bunch of players. Are there who any, like say, are there any leaders? You didn't mention Troy either, John. <laughs> but, no, but he wasn't a player can, at that point, was can, he? He was injured laugh, that part. You yeah. can laugh about that, but but we always used to talk about it. We? When way back when, many years ago, when, we, when Leicester were bidding for him every transfer window, we'd say if he goes, you, you, there's two players you need to replace him with: a striker and a leader. And it just feels like we we've not had leaders for. For quite some time, and and yeah, that perhaps that's what we needed on Saturday: someone to grab hold of them and drag them through the game. So to top and tail, really, then, John, you mentioned Hansen's post, which I fully understand. We're learning why, as we talk through this game, why why we do have these sort of post mortems. Because again, we've sort of we've pulled at another thread and sort of worked out that we haven't got any leaders now. So not only have we not got any goal scorers, uh, not only have we got um, this, that or the other, we haven't got any, any leaders. And it all leads back to sort of, look, I think the general discontent and the general frustration arises from the fact that we feel like we've been let down by the owners, by the owner, sorry. We, since we got relegated that first time, they've, they've made a pig's ear of it. And now it seems to me that they're sort of looking to wind down their their investment in it one way or another, because you look at the, the activity over the, over the summer and it, it tells its own story. And I think it's sort of, I think people are upset. People are sort of a bit still, despite the fact that it's happened over quite a long time. It's quite, it's shell shocked almost to a degree to look back at, at what we were achieving four or five years ago and where, where we are now. We're back to where we started from. And that's quite difficult for, for people to, to take. And I think the ultimate, well, I don't think it, it's, it's the only uh, um, the only reason for that is the owner and, and and the decisions that they've made. You say we're so going that, back. You saying going back to what was what was last year? I, I swear we've no we've back done. before when back <laughs> before you know the, before the Pozzos took over. Uh, okay, I mean this is it. you know I, so I thought we dealt, dealt with de- meeting and dealing with Gino six months ago or a few <laughs> months ago. Decided, we did it. Did we do it? And actually, someone did say that. Someone and I can't remember where it was on our social. Someone said, "Well, we need to ask questions of the of the uh, of the owner." I think well, we did that. And I think the one mm. thing I would always have from his answers is that he don't care. He's going to do what he thinks he's going to do. The things you're hinting at there, Mike, you know, the whole idea that maybe the investment, the uh, emotional as well as financial investment doesn't quite seem true. And, and I did see um, Jordan Wyman uh, at Watford Analytics. He did sort of say the head coach didn't have his best performance. Yeah, we've, we've pretty much <laughs> gone through the details of that one. But that loss highlighted the deficiencies uh, of quality in vital areas. Yep, 100% with the air, Jordan. If the owner decides that this is a coaching issue, we're in big trouble. It would illustrate inability to adapt and the situation would be unrecoverable, in my opinion. It is this time of year. We are a week away. <laughs> mm-hmm. We are a week away from an international break. And I really started thinking, you know, when was the last time? we? St- we were, when, was, when, did I, when were our brains not full of... Oh, that could go. Oh, we could go after that. Oh, it's only a few weeks. And when do we last not have that on our brain as Watford fans? And I mentioned the WhatsApp group, and I think it was Havi. 
It wasn't until Harry went and Kike came in for his second stint. Since then, that's when our brains have been going six weeks and then you're off. And they've done it. Gino's done it consistently across that whole time. Hmm. But it is a and conversation think- we need to sort of, sort of have. You've mentioned the two away losses, Mike. That's a possibility and it would mean quite a lot. But you just can't see because of what he's been given, what the club have invested in, it isn't enough to be challenging for promotion 100%, no. but it no. should be better than it is. Yeah, I mean, my take is that this is, this, is, this, is a, this is a side, this is a squad that's been put together to sit in mid-table, to sit comfortably in mid-table, not to worry about going down. It's not going to go up. If we can snuck into the playoffs, brilliant. But that's what I think it's been... In put, been put together to do because otherwise Gino would have found some way of finding some money down the sofa to buy some more players ultimately with the additions we've made that statement of intent is 100% clear as far as I'm concerned so that's been put together and it's, it's the, the, the idea is I'm not even convinced it's a rebuild I think it's just a reassessment and a realignment and getting clearing the decks and just being level a bit not worrying about the Premier League not after worrying about getting back up to fill the, the black hole um, of finances clearing the decks filling the hole with of the finances by selling Sar and Pedro and getting back on an even keel that feels to me what it's what it's all, all about so you're right Valerian Ishmael has not been given the tools to go for success in, t- in, in the same in the, with success being defined in the way it has been previously which has been promotion Rob Edwards I think had a better record than Valerian Ishmael at this, th- this time and was sacked and to answer your question I think we will see a different reaction and I think we can probably relax in that regard because you're right John there's absolutely before Gino Pozzo could say well look we've got a decent squad a different manager is going to come in and make them make them good that was that was the argument, and that was almost the argument that that Scott and Gina were making at the at the meeting before the before the season, wasn't it? At the the, the fans meeting at the at London Colney, that we, if we get the right manager, we'll do well. But that if you just look at the squad, he has not been given a squad to challenge at the top end of the table. So the frames of reference have changed. The the idea of success has changed, and therefore the pressure on him is still there because he's a Watford head coach, and we all know what what happens. But who, who's, who will he bring in and why would it be any different this time? Because the players are the players. We haven't got Saar, Pedro or any of those other guys who can change a game on their own. We haven't really got the players that, that Gino Pozzo could march into the office and say, look, you've got all these Premier League players. You've got all these players that we've hung on to. You've got all these players on big contracts and big money. Do better. He hasn't got that anymore. So sacking Flair and Ishmael would be a surprise to me because I think there is a, a complete and utter reset of expectations, and that's everyone and that's, and that, at, at the football club, and that's led by Gino Pozzo. If he expected success, he would have found some money somehow, but he has invested next to nothing, and so that, for me, is him saying, look, right, enough of this nonsense, or we need to take stock. Whether that's with a view to him getting the club sold, him getting out of it, um, and making the club more um, attractive because it, it, on the face of it, it's more stable. Yes, it's mired in the championship, but at least it's more stable. You don't have to worry about getting big earners off the wage, uh, off the wage bill. You don't have to shift this player because he's on a this sort of contract. Getting cutting away all that stuff and it just being a normal championship football club might make it easier to sell. And so th- there are. Th- this is what this is what I mean. There are so many questions and so many imponderables and so many sort of un- levels of uncertainty that, that still surround the football club, really, that it's, it's no wonder that we, we sort of, we ask ourselves these questions. Oh, is he going to sack him or what, 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 what should happen here? Why aren't we doing this? Why are we doing that? And it is still hard just to go to the game and, and just enjoy it for what it is. I, like I said, I'm able to do that, but I understand the sort of sense of discontent. And what, the only thing that, that upsets me really is... I don't really feel like we're in it together at the moment as as Watford supporters. I think, and that is, this isn't criticism of anyone. It doesn't really feel like we're getting behind the team. It doesn't really feel like we are a united 
bunch of supporters. And again, that's not critical because for all the reasons I've spoken about, why would we be? There well, I think we were, re- we were starting to, I think, when a certain, you know, the, the I'm not saying they're big improvements, but it, it was, it's been better this season in terms of some playing style in front of us, which yeah. we didn't have last year. And I think that was the thing that we were starting to like, and that would have been, it just seemed to have disappeared completely over the last two games. And I think that's what we're sort of craving for. Um, Jace, do you think is there anything else that would sort of do you think that would bring the the fans together apart from a couple of free pints, maybe, <laughs> or or just better performances on the pitch, maybe? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It's it's difficult. I know, obviously, different people want different things from football. Ultimately, and and it almost comes back to to Hansen's point about um, reacting to games and or not reacting to games with sort of micro analysis and, and sort of deep diving into what went wrong and what we should do to fix it all. Um, some people, yeah, absolutely 100% just want to win because they've got to go and talk to their mates who support other football teams at work on a Monday or they're exchanging WhatsApp messages with them or they're reacting to people on Twitter that, they, that they've that uh, they become embroiled in, in arguments with and that sort of thing. <sighs> But other people want different things. They 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 enjoy it because they go with their mates. They they go out. They have a few beers. The football is almost a sideshow. They go with their families, or they do it, and then they chat about it on podcasts afterwards. And and win, lose, or draw. That's that's all they want. And I think because you've got those different groups of fans, you then end up with I don't know people not quite bouncing off each other in the right way or in a positive way and that's what then creates the, the negativity and I think until you've got a winning team it may seem obvious but I think only when you've got a winning team that is the only when everyone in the fan base is is happy or yeah. 99% of the fan base are happy so it's it's difficult but but ultimately wins make the difference and you, you, you know, you're right. What, why do we go to see these football matches? And I can tell you, we got an email yesterday from Matt Nobbs, uh, who is an exile hornet, um, long time listener. Uh, but thank you for actually getting in touch, Mac, Matt. Um, he said he um, is a what fan in exile. He's down, he's down near Bristol, I think, somewhere down there. He tends to only go to away games. He's got two boys. The youngest, Freddie, who's seven, has been to four games, with the most recent being the game on the weekend. Before that. He has two games last season, Bristol City away and Swansea away. And then he went to Stoke away this season. Yes, you can add it up. That's 5-0 on Agra. He is yet to see, until Saturday, yet to see a goal go in. I asked Matt, send us a, send a recording of, uh, of, of the story. And that's what he said about the moment he had on Saturday. On the way out of the Stoke game, he actually asked myself and Jeff if he was cursed because every time we go to see Watford, they don't do very well. So on the long drive down to Watford on Saturday, we had a conversation about what we wanted from the game. Obviously, we wanted the Hornets to win, but really the main thing for us was for Freddie to see his first Watford goal. So when Bayo rolled in Watford's first, Freddie's first, in front of the Anne Swanson stand yesterday, I can honestly say it was one of the happiest I've ever been at a football match. Probably even topping the FA Cup semi-final for me personally. Obviously, that's extremely subjective point of view. Even though we ended up losing the game, we were absolutely buzzing all the way home. Unusually for us, my wife came along to the game and decided to take a photo of us celebrating his big moment when it went in. It was a really, really incredible feeling. And I just thought I would share it because we talk about special moments. Uh, we, hear, we hear the pod talk about special moments. And obviously, it's something that will stand by me forever. And... Maybe that does make me a happy clapper. I was definitely a happy clapper on the way home yesterday evening. Anyway, keep up the good work uh, from the rookery end. And come on, you golden boys. So, Mike, a simple goal. That's all it took to give a little seven-year-old Freddie uh, a smile on his face. Uh, he got to see Watford score a goal. And I think if he can do that, and as he said, he, he, off down the, uh, the M4, it's all happy. That even though Watford lost, they were all happy because they'd got to see and then Freddie. And, and we'll share that picture. The picture that um, Matt sent, he's, he's happy with us to share it. Uh, the joy, the absolute joy on Freddie uh, and his brother's face is brilliant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, a nice reminder of of ultimately what it's all about, the the purity of it. We've seen more of the nonsense about football this week with VAR and Liverpool and Spurs, and we're obviously not going to go into that. But ultimately, it's about those moments, isn't it? Whether it's scoring, whether it's it's winning. And it, it, is as simple as, it is as simple as that, isn't it? And I just yearn for it to be as simple as that on a more <laughs> regular basis for, <laughs> for, for more of us. As Jason said, there's so many different people who need different things out of their, their Watford supporting life. And the winning team does make a, a difference. I think we have got a team that, that at least cares. We've got a head coach who at least has got a vague idea. We know that all the, the community stuff carries on. There's so much good work that goes on behind the, the scenes. The Taylor Trek is coming up, which is a super thing to get involved with if you can. So the constituent parts are are, are there with the, with the football club. And we know that we're still outperforming um, clubs much, much bigger than us or with much more storied histories. So Watford, in the, in the grand scheme of things, are doing OK. But as Jay said, it would be so nice. When was like an away win? Two wins in a row. It just happens so so infrequently that it's it, it, it's it's tough for everyone at the moment. I get it, and I, that's kind of what I wanted to say. It's sort of it's not a criticism. It's more like I, I feel you. I feel it. I feel it as well. And I just wonder. I I mentioned being in the relegation zone. I just wonder whether fighting releg. I'm just putting it out there. Playing devil's advocate <laughs> would. By having a little relegation battle, one that we can actually win potentially, not like the last time in the Premier League when we knew that the uh, that the game was up, would it actually give us something as supporters to to fight for and and unite and get behind and perhaps reignite a bit of that that spark and a bit of that passion? Who knows? Let's hope it doesn't doesn't come to that. But um, yeah. On to, the, uh, on to the next one. Don't have yeah. long to wait, do we? We don't. And uh, some of you may be w- waiting to listen to this podcast as you travel up to Sunderland uh, on Wednesday. Good good on you. Because it's always a long journey up there. But uh, there's no chance I could ever make that. Unless I had a special personal helicopter. Maybe. Uh, but no, there's no chance of me getting up there. Um, or most of us to get up there after work. Uh, but do enjoy the trip if you're listening to the podcast. Um, but again, Sunderland away. Cardiff away, you know, Mike, you're pessimistic about it. You're saying, oh, what if it's two losses? Jason, what if it's two wins? Do you reckon that would help you a little bit? Oh, it would definitely help two wins, uh, two unexpected wins. Um, we've seen Sunderland uh, take advantage of, a, of another poor performing team. Poor old Cisco. Uh, <laughs> not going well for him at, uh, at Sheffield Wednesday, is it? Um, and they, yeah, I think they made light work of them. So if we turn up like we did on Saturday, I'm sure Sunderland will equally make light work of us. Thank you very much, Michael. No problem. Come on, you Goldens. Come on, you Goldens, indeed. And thank you, Jason. Thank you. Obviously, it was quite a pessimistic one today, but come on, Watford. Yeah, we get, we have to go through these sometimes. Um, I do think there's one thing, Michael, that um, and now we're not doing the podcast after the game. I don't know if uh, Leanne, your good lady, uh, if uh, if she's having worse weekends, that you're not having that sort of uh, de-stressed <laughs> conversation that we have after a game. We used to have, <laughs> should I say, on a Saturday outside the Hornet shop. So I hope uh, things aren't as, as, as bad for her. Uh, but thank you so much for listening uh, to the podcast, as you all do. Uh, and it's, it's brilliant when we see you, you download we're happy if it's one of you two of you will be brilliant Um, but it's really fantastic thank you so much Uh, do keep following us on the socials at Watford Podcast Uh, and of course we'll be back after next weekend after two away games come on you odds